There they are. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of John. We have begun a new series there um, just a few weeks ago. And as you turn there, uh, you could go straight to chapter four. Um, can you believe it? We're already in chapter four. Um, we are plowing through this book. Uh, I wish we could go slower, but, you know, time. Uh, but hopefully, again, you are reading through uh, as we go through this series together. Uh, we're just taking pieces, parts of John, and, and, and really just unpacking them together. Um, but again, as you're turning there and getting there, just a reminder of where we started. Chapter one, John really established these points saying to us, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm about to uh, describe to you and prove to you a few major points. One, that Jesus is God, but he was also f- fully human, that he was the son of God, that he was Messiah and the Christ. And now for the next few chapters, I'm going to show you that through testimony, through signs, through um, uh, John's testimony, John the Baptist, because remember, we see him uh, talked about a lot at the beginning of this, of this book. Like all these things that he's going to cover, these wonderful stories, these wonderful testimonies, his own testimony, the disciples' testimony, to show us and to prove these points out to us. And this is no different. And what we've been seeing in these stories is that either in the center or at the end of the interaction that these people have with Jesus, decisions have to be made. Decisions about Jesus have to be made. Some are right on and others are not. Well, you got sometimes these religious leaders who are like, yeah, I don't believe any of what you're selling me, Jesus. And then you got outcasts, disciples, people who are like, whoa, you... You must be the one. You, this is true. This is real. I, gotta, I, I need more of this. I need to follow you. So there's this other consistent theme that's going on of how do we respond to Jesus? How do these people respond to Jesus? And this story is no different because to, to, we're about to jump into a story where there's this interaction between Jesus and this woman, and the response is just incredible. And it should cause a response out of us. Who do we say Jesus is? So we'll go verse by verse. Hopefully you brought your notes to take some notes with. Um, We'll start right there in verse one. John chapter four, verse one. Say, I got it if you got it. Here we go. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Now this John isn't the writer of this book. It's Johnny B. Remember Johnny B.? Okay, we give him a little name. Okay, uh, baptizing more than the disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from, from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So let me give you a few notes, a few things you're going to want to know already and what's happening here. So imagine Escondido. Okay, anybody from there? Anybody live there? Okay, oh. okay imagine Escondido, and you're trying to get uh, to Temecula on the 15 freeway. That's where I'm from, okay? Two of us, woo, three of us, okay? You're trying to get to Temecula. So that's, that's kind of the route that Jesus is taking, okay? Now, in order to get there, you got to get through, you got to drive through Fallbrook. Okay. Right. Yes. We're all on the same geographical map. Okay. So imagine that that's what's about to happen. He's got to go up to Temecula and he's got to go through Fallbrook. Okay. Here's the difference though. Most Jews, especially like strong Jewish leaders did not go through Fallbrook. Imagine what they did is they, they, they took the long route and they went through like Vista and then went up to Temecula and went around, like up the five and went around. And then to you, you're like, I would literally never do that. If I put that in maps, you're like, that does not make any sense for me to go out of my way like that to get to Temecula, right? But here's the, here's the thing. In Fallbrook, there's people, <laughs> if you're from Fallbrook, I'm sorry. If there's people that you just don't get along with. So that is why you are going around. You are so not about Fallbrook. You're so not about the people in Fallbrook that you rather go around. That's literally the scene we have here, okay? Most Jews would go around to get to Galilee and not go through Samaria. 
because there was a lot of beef there, okay? Jews and Samaritans did not get along. Like historically, they did not get along because Samaritans were a mixed race of what was known as Gentiles, pretty much anybody else that's not a Jew, and Jews, okay? They intermarried and they intermixed. And in that intermarriage and mixing, things got super murky when it came to faith, okay? In time, they created their own scriptures. In time, they created their own worship places and where to go to worship. In time, they even created their own version of the Israelite history, okay? All these things were remade. So you can imagine the Jews who take a lot of pride in their God, their religion, where they worship in Jerusalem and their faith and their history. They get these people in their mind, these people are completely jacking up our history, our God, what we believe in, our, our faith. So it caused so much strife that like even at times Rome would have to get involved because to like break them up because there was like miniature wars going on around them all the time. This is this scene. So Jesus is like, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to walk right through Samaria. So I, be I bet you the disciples were like, dude, what is this guy doing? Where's he taking us? But this is the scene. So he ends up there. A couple more things that you're going to want to know. It's a historical scene, right? It's Jacob's well. Okay, here we understand Jacob and Joseph are forefathers of, of Israel. So uh, at a historical scene, um, at a place that probably, especially Jesus in their culture shouldn't be long or shouldn't be, at high noon, which is the sixth hour, okay, which is the hottest part of the day, right? Speaking about heat, we're all hanging out. Oh, this feels nice, right? Free AC in here right now, okay? Imagine a hot day like this. This is where Jesus is, right? The, the top of the uh, middle of the day, he's at this well at a historical place in a town that he probably shouldn't be in according to his culture, and that's the scene we're walking into. Fair? We know where we are? Okay, here's what breaks out. Verse seven, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So he's by himself. It's just them two. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Another continuous theme that, we're, that we keep seeing in John is this upside down type of thinking. We, okay, we called it upside down kingdom type of thinking. That Jesus is constantly doing the opposite of what people think he should be doing, right? Even this woman, because not only should he not be there because it's at the top, it's in the middle of the day, it, he's a Jew, he's in Samaria, but now he's talking to a woman. In their time, that was not a thing, especially alone. That was not happening. Like you think like we may have some like standards at church or whatever, like going and talking to a girl or whatever, and people look at you weird or, or even like I'm a married man. It would be super awkward if I was driving a woman around town just by ourselves, like constantly. People would be like, that's questionable, right? Already we have that in our culture. In their time, it was times a thousand. That was just not a thing, okay? So she even realizes this scene. First of all, you're asking something of me. You're a man, I'm a woman. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. What? What? Why are you even speaking to me right now? Like, this is not a thing. You're breaking in our culture all kinds of cultural norms right now. But Jesus, he's like, I'm going to talk to you, and it's okay to talk to you. Now, another thing that we need to understand here is this. No one should actually be there going to draw water, especially women, okay? Here's why. Because the, the women would have already gone to get water early in the morning or late that evening, okay? Why? It's too hot, right? We're not talking about like go to the refrigerator and get water. We're talking about you had to carry jugs of water up a hill, get it from the well and bring it back. You're not going to do that at noon. You're going to get up early when it's cool of the day, do it or early evening, right? So this woman, what we learn and what we're going to continue to learn through this story, she's there. She shouldn't even be there. But the reason that she's there is because she can't go in the morning. So she can't go in the early evening. So she's an outcast. Women won't even hang out with her. They won't be seen with her. They won't even go draw water with her. So she decides to go at noon. 
So that only adds to this moment. Jesus speaking to a Samaritan, speaking to a Samaritan woman, speaking to an outcast in a, in a, in a, in a historical place, in a place in Samaria where he probably shouldn't even be seen culturally. That's the scene. That's what's happening here. Like Jesus doing things upside down. Verse 10. Oh, I lost myself. There it is. Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you, would give, give you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Stop there for a second. Oh, there's some good stuff here happening. So Jesus is like, hey, if you even knew who was talking to you right now, <laughs> if you understood, you'd be asking me for stuff. Like you would be asking me for living water if you truly understood who I was. And I love what she does. She goes to this place of all like logistics and like, and, and what she seems to understand, which brings me to my first major point. Self-imposed boundaries are what keep us from Jesus. Self-imposed boundaries are what keep us from Jesus. He says to her, if you understood who was talking to you, you would want to receive. You would be in a receiving posture if you actually saw me, if you actually understood. Instead, the woman quickly shows her cards and quickly shows her boundaries that she's setting up herself. The first one is this, cultural divides, right? Because of sex, because of race, because of where she came from, because of where he comes from. We're not even supposed to be speaking. Here you are asking something of me and then saying to me that if I truly knew you, what? The second piece is this. The second boundary is logistics. She goes to logistics. You don't even have a jar, dude. <laughs> what are you going to do? Jump into the well and try to bring some water out, right? She uses whatever excuse. You don't even, you don't even have something, uh, the, the right tool to give me whatever water you, you seem to be talking about. Another boundary, religious upbringing, right? She goes straight to the historical spot. Hey, um, are you greater than Jacob? Are you greater than Joseph? Are you greater than history? What are you saying here? Because later on, we're actually going to read that he, she kind of, she doesn't call Jesus out, I would say, but like she, she brings, she comes back to a divide and we're going to come back to a second. But he, he, he says to her, he's like, even your people think that where I'm worshiping right now doesn't even matter and it doesn't even count. She's using religious boundaries, religious divide to keep herself from even truly being able to see Jesus. She questions his authority. You think you're greater than these guys? You think you're greater than them? She is stuck seeing Jesus the way the world sees Jesus. With rules, regulations, limits, boundaries. Seeing him according to her own knowledge and stipulations. On who the Messiah might be. You know who it reminds me of? Nicodemus. <laughs> Nicodemus too. He was limited of being able to truly see who was sitting right in front of him. Even with all the knowledge of the history of Israel and the law, he was still somehow missing Jesus for who he truly was right in front of him. So was this woman. And this is us. This is us today. This is literally an example of us today. The boundaries we put before ourselves and Jesus. Think about them. Oh, I can't. I can't talk to Jesus. I can't connect with Jesus. I can't accept those things of Jesus. I can't see him. I'm too guilty. I can't be received by him. He'll see too much of my shame. I don't, understand, I don't actually fully understand him, so we can't have any type of relationship. My family, whew, they don't believe, so there's no way I can believe. My friends, if I raise my hands during a, a, a worship service or if they find out that I come here on Sunday mornings, they will make so much fun of me. It, I, 
I have to be too vulnerable. So I can't. I can't be vulnerable. Whatever excuse we use to set up a boundary, we do it between us and Jesus. But like Jesus says, if we actually truly realize who it is that is calling us to himself, <laughs> you would drop everything and ask him for living water. Ask him for true life, for that new heart he's been talking about these last few chapters, that rejuvenated spirit he's been inviting us into, like he did with Nicodemus. So here's my question at the end of this point. What boundaries have you set or do you set between you and Jesus? I mean, we literally talk about coming to the fountain. We talk about coming to Jesus. We come uh, to, coming before his presence, but only to a certain point. Nope, Jesus, stay right there. You can't, you can't come past these three spots. That's far enough. Jesus, stop moving. You can't come closer. Because if you truly knew me, Jesus, you'd be disgusted. Because if I truly let you that close to me, I may have to give up too much. And I don't know if I can trust you like that because I don't know if I can trust anyone like that. If I let you that close, that intimate into my heart, it means my life has to change and I don't think I want it to change. I kind of like where the life that I'm living where I call all the shots, whatever it is. 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus makes her aware of her need immediately by using the simple thing called water, right? It's literally the biggest thing in her mind right there, right now, right? Water. So he uses this idea and actually he continues to use it throughout the scriptures here in John. But he goes to it and he says, I know what you need. I have what you need. Jesus gives her the answer to her greatest need. He goes beyond just basic thirst he goes to the thirst of her spirit, of her heart. He says, what you actually need is me. You need me. Just like he said to Nicodemus as well. Who you need is me. Who you and the people need to look to is me. And he, and he gives her that. He says that to her. Living water is what you need. Spring of water that gives eternal life is what he says to her. Here's my next point. Jesus wants to provide at the heart level. Listen, Jesus wants to provide at the heart level while we get stuck at the surface level. Jesus wants to provide at the heart level, but we get stuck at the surface level. Here's what I mean by that. Look at what she says to him in 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Where does she go to immediately, you guys? She immediately goes to her basic need. And she's like, oh my gosh, this water sounds amazing. Sounds tasty. Can I have it? She goes directly to her basic surface needs. I don't ever want to thirst again, literally. And I don't want to do this labor. I don't want to get up and come up here in the middle of the day. Man, if you give me this water, give it to me now. So I'll never thirst again. And I'll never have to come up here again. I don't have to work. She goes to the, the, the basic surfacey stuff. I don't want to be exhausted anymore. I don't want to have to battle anymore. I don't want to feel seen by others and be just judged when I come up here. When Jesus is trying to heal her from the inside out to change her spirit and give her a new heart, she is stuck at the surface. She's going to the basics of stuff and God's like, man, I'm talking about something way deeper than you even understand. Now she does ask for it though. She wants this living water he is offering, even though she doesn't fully understand it. And this is, where, this is how it starts, I think, usually for us. We think we know what we want God to heal us from, when in reality, he came to heal us from so much more. The present, the past, and the future. What if we didn't limit Jesus? Like, 
how he heals us at the heart level by giving us a new heart and how he continues to work in us in our life. Man, I, I, I'll be honest. When I first got saved, when I first gave my heart to Jesus, like, and I made that call and I made that decision, I prayed that prayer. When I think back to that moment, I mean, I was a child in my thinking when it came to truth. And I think God's okay with that. Um, but I know if I think back to those moments, it was about Jesus' stuff, why I responded. Like it wasn't about a relationship fully with him, he fully knowing me and me fully knowing him. It was, but it was about what I could get from him. Were you going to heal me? And these things are going to go away? Maybe my life is going to get better? Maybe I'll be happy? Maybe I'll feel joy now? Those were like those initial things. And as, I, and I, as God was being presented to me and was showing up in my life, man, I could already see some of that stuff. So I responded like this woman. But just like this woman, man, Jesus did something in me that is way more trans, like transformed me from the inside out than just the surfacey like happiness. Arnold, dude, that's a byproduct, man. That's, that'll come. Joy, that'll come. We're going to get after the greatest need that you have, and that is a new heart, and that is a reborn spirit. I'm going to give you that because that is what you need, and out of that will spring true life. The living water, like a light, brings truth to her life. The living water, like a light, brings truth to her life. Look at what happens next. It's about to get real. Okay, so she asked for this. She thinks it's surfacy. God takes it to a whole other level. Jesus takes it to a whole other level. After she says, give me this thing so I'm not thirsty no more, so I don't have to labor anymore. He goes, Jesus said to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. Oh boy. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right. In saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. <laughs> Jesus, dang. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Whoa. He calls her out a little bit, right? Like she gets a little smart. She's like, I don't have a husband. And what does he say? You're right. You're, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. And the guy that you're with right now, he's not even your husband. Whoa. Look at her response. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Let's pause there for a second. This is huge. While she is stuck at the surface level of her needs, Jesus takes the conversation straight to her heart by looking into the darkest part of her life. He kind of calls her out. He kind of exposes her, but that is what he's been saying from the very beginning of John is going to happen, that the light will expose these types of, these types of things. She must have felt condemned in the moment because he, she responds to him like, I could tell that you're a prophet. Like, you know, here, here we go again. A Jew, a man, a prophet about to call me out because then the next thing she says about like, you guys say that I'm supposed to worship in Jerusalem but, and not here on this mountain where we believe we're supposed to worship God. So she's basically getting defensive right? Which who wouldn't when he just exposed her deepest, darkest secret. But I don't believe that Jesus exposed this in order to shame her. He exposed her in order to deliver her, to free her from the very thing that is locking her up. See, the whole time we think we're the ones that are supposed to be coming to Jesus, when in reality, Jesus is the one that's coming to us. She set all of these boundaries between her and Jesus, and one after the other, he just unravels them. It's like, it's like if she was standing at the back, right at the back end of the room, right? And I'm Jesus. It's like all these boundaries are set up and he just steps through the one, steps through the next one and continues to step through. We think we're on the other side having to figure out all these boundaries and how to deal with all of them, how to forgive ourselves. 
how to let go of shame in order to get close to Jesus and, and come in this direction. When in reality, constantly Jesus is doing this over and over to get to us. And with that move, it's like he plowed through the last wall. It's like, I, I see you. I don't just see you as a woman, as a Samaritan in the middle of the day, an outcast that nobody wants to talk to. I see the very depths of your soul. I know your deepest, darkest secret. And guess what? I'm still here. What? And you must have rocked her. It's like, wait, so why aren't you running for the hills? If you know who I truly am, why aren't you running to the hills? You're still standing here? You're still seeing me? And that is the power of Jesus and what he wants to do in your and my life. I mean, let me ask you this. How can Jesus free you from your prison if you won't let him into your prison to show you the way out? How? How? How will we ever deal with these prisons that we put ourselves in. If we won't let Jesus in in order to show us the way out, he's not, going, he's not coming and saying, oh, I see you. Mm, Arnold, look, mm, look what you did again. Oh, shame. He's like, no, let me, we got to get out of here. I got you. Let's go. No, no, I can't talk to you about those things, Jesus. I'm just going to keep building walls, 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 walls. In this moment, she knows he's different. What's interesting though, she still doesn't know he's Messiah, right? So can you imagine her brain in this moment? That's why she calls him a prophet too. She's like, it's evident that you're a prophet. Like she's trying to figure it out. She's like, who the heck is this guy, right? Talking to me, risking all kind of cultural taboos, like telling me the deepest, darkest secrets of my life. Like, is he, is he trying to come after me? Is he hurting me? Wh what is this? And it's like she starts unraveling a little bit at a time. Because he knows her. He didn't hear about her. He didn't guess. He looked into the depths of her soul and wasn't shaken by it. That's our Jesus. That's, that's who we serve. That's who I serve. Because I know that he looks at me with the same gaze and the same understanding. And I don't deserve him. He still loves me. And I'm here to tell you that he, he feels the same way about you. He knows where you've been. He's not tricked by it. He's not surprised. Like, oh, did, wow, you really sent worse than anyone on this planet. What? He gets it. He sees you. That's why we get to see and, and read stories like this that John put in here. Hey, just like he saw and came to this woman, he comes to you and he comes to me. And nothing's going to keep him away. She can't help but wonder. But she kind of doubles down a little bit because she doesn't really know he's Messiah. She's still trying to figure it out. Look at verse 20. I think I read it for you already, but I'll read it again. 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So again, she kind of goes back to that, um, that space of like defending herself to give into that divide, that religious divide. Well, you say that I don't even get to really worship God. In that statement where you guys say that, that we can worship God only in Jerusalem, but not here on this mountaintop where we believe we can worship God, she's basically calling him out and saying, well, guess what? As Jews, you know what you guys believe is that we can't even come to God. Like we literally have no access to him. So as she's unraveling and she's wondering, and who is this guy? But she's kind of feeling it, but she doesn't really know. She's still trying to like protect herself and kind of like push back a little bit and saying, how can you tell me these things? How can you tell me that you can give me living water? How can you tell me basically that I get some access to God when your people literally in history have said to me, I have zero access to God? Because for them in their culture, it wasn't like us. The only way that you would have access to God is to go to the temple. And that was in Jerusalem. And they weren't allowed there. So that's what she's saying. So you're telling me something that is completely upside down. 
And that's what Jesus does. Because look at what he says to her next. She's like, oh, it's like he's God or something. Watch. 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do know. Sorry, what you do not know. We, Jews, worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now, real quick, what I love about John, John is doing there is he's not... He's not going to paint, because you can read this, this part like Jesus is just throwing away the past, the history, and the temple, and all the law, and all the things. That's, Jesus is not doing that. He never does that. In fact, he, he came in order to show you what it was all for in the first place, which was to point us to God. Yet we made it this man-made way to work ourselves up to God, climbing the ladder type of thing. Right? So he identifies with the Jews. He's not, not anti Semitic. Like he's about the Jews and understanding to the call that God gave to Abraham, the promise gave to Abraham that through his people, that through Israel, God would be known. Okay? But he's saying, that's about to be complete in me. Look at what he says. But the hour is coming. And is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So he's telling her, a time is coming where it won't matter where you worship. The temple and the mountain were turned into barriers when always they were intended to point us to the Father, to point us to who was to come, Jesus. Jesus is now here, and he's going to break these boundaries. He's going to break these barriers. We're going to talk about this when we get back to his resurrection, that whole idea where uh, you go back and you read in the scriptures that right after he died, the curtain in the temple was, was torn from top to bottom, from the holy to the holy of holies, where it was said that his presence was, that literally the curtain was ripped from the bottom down, that's literally already echoing right here. All of that is going to be brought down. It was originated and done so that people could be pointed to God. But that won't matter now because I'm here, he's saying to her. And a true worshiper, it won't matter if you're in Jerusalem, if you're on a mountain. It doesn't matter. You're going to get to worship God now, full access. You don't need to be inside of these walls you know why? Because God is spirit, he says to her. Meaning he has no, no physical matter, no physical form. He doesn't have a material body, but has more of a wonderful kind of existence that is everywhere and present. Which is why we can worship from anywhere. But he says to her, you will have access to him through me. Because through me, you will be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, with full heart and full mind. But you cannot worship God with a, a true heart if you don't have a new heart. Comes back to the same thing he's been teaching through all of John. You need a new heart. And in order to get that new heart, you're going to need me because I can deliver that for you. I can give that to you. And, he, and Jesus just must have blown her mind in that moment because all of a sudden she's led to what she understood about the Messiah. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. So like, he, it's like this conversation is like breaking down like to this point where she's like, okay, here's what I know. <laughs> here's what I understand. And you keep blowing my mind with these ideas. And, and, and it gets her to the point of her actually talking about what sh the Savior, the one who's to come. Because maybe, maybe, just maybe a little bit, it's resembling this conversation and she's seeing something here, but she doesn't fully know. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus drops the line on her. I so, oh, I wish I was a fly in the wall. He says to her, I who speak to you am he. Oh, what? What? That's exciting. 
I mean, here she is. Don't talk to me. Why are you even talking to me? Do you know who I really am? He like breaks through all these barriers. He's uh, speaking into her, her very soul. He's telling her about like heavenly things. They're having this crazy conversation to a person who literally feels this big in society and culture. And all of a sudden, he proclaims to be Messiah in front of her. Well, I know that the one is coming. I know that the Messiah, the Christ is going to be here, and he's going to teach us all these things. Because obviously Jesus was teaching her all kinds of new things that were like blowing her mind. And so she's like, so I know the Messiah is coming. And he's like, mic drop. I'm actually him. What? What? Are you serious? You guys, listen, this might not matter to you, but, and I'm not coming at you, but the stuff that I read in here, I actually believe this stuff. Arnold believes this stuff. So if Jesus plows through the sky one day, which he will, according to his scriptures, I'm going to be like, whoa, there it is. It came to fruition. I read about it. I had faith in it. I knew it would come one day. I didn't know it was going to be on a Tuesday, which probably won't be on Tuesday now, according to the scriptures. But, whoa, it's here. And here is this woman in the middle of the day, wondering, questioning, maybe in tears, who knows, be, feeling all kinds of emotions. And Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. Here's what's crazy, you guys. Jesus has not, up to this point in his life and in his ministry, publicly declared to be Messiah yet. Yet he chose this woman, this outcast in her culture, this less than in her culture, this feeling less than by her own doing in her culture. The way that she even saw herself was less than. He says, I'm coming to you. And I'm going to tell you the good news. You don't have to stay there. You can be delivered. All you need is me. I will give you a new heart. I will rebirth your spirit. And the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you. That it will literally spring living water out of you. And you know what? It does. Like, it does. She goes crazy. So the disciples show up all of a sudden and you can tell, have you ever showed up to a conversation between two people and you know, like something just happened, right? And they're like looking at each other, like smiling maybe, or like whatever. And you're like, you show up, what just happened, right? That, that's like what's happening right now. The disciples show up and she's probably like giddy, like, dude, you have no idea what he just said to me, right? And she doesn't even have conversations with them. She just takes off. They don't, they in their mind are questioning like, why is he even talking to her? Like the same questions anybody in culture would have had. They're, they're going, uh, John tells us that it's going through their mind, but nobody says it. Like, why is he even talking to a woman? They don't even say it because this moment, it seems to be like awesome, real, intense, who knows, right? And so all of a sudden, Jesus or, or, or this woman takes off. She takes off into the city. What, dude, come talk to this guy. He's told me everything I ever did, which by the way, she must have not felt that condemned or that like, you know, shame to be like, you all know, he knows, everybody knows what I've done. He told me what I've, uh, I've ever done. Come and meet him. Like she did literally, this is what I'm getting at because I have to wrap up here. But <laughs> her life and her soul was so shifted, was so changed by Jesus coming to her and offering her the good news and her accepting that invitation, that it didn't matter anymore who she was in the past or what she had done to the point that she ran into the city. She just had to tell everybody what went down because they had to experience what she experienced. And I hope we could live like that. That's the challenge I'll leave with you this week. As the band comes up, we're going to end with a song. My hope would be that you go off that way. Not because you have to, right? Jesus wasn't like, okay, now that you did this, you go be my soldier and you have to tell everybody. No. It truly sprung out of her. He told her it would. It's like, man, this is going to rock your soul so deep that you're going to be like, everybody's got to know. It's just going to spring out of me.
And she walks into that invitation. And my hope would be that you walk into that invitation. That if you have put your faith in Jesus, he has done a work in you, that it may spring out of you to those around you. And if not, and you're on that journey, you're asking questions, you're wondering, man, I welcome you. I welcome you to look into this story. Go back and read it yourself. May you be encouraged. How God comes to us. It is no mistake you're in this place right now. Don't ignore that. Don't ignore that Jesus sees you to the very depths of who you are and says, I love you. Let's talk. I got you. I got something to offer you beyond worldly and surfacy that will change your whole being. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your truth. We worship you now.